If we feel the seawater is warmer than usual, we need to report it immediately. They never tell us why. I assume there's some thermal vent beneath us, but there's no actual evidence of that. Reporting heat fluctuations is just one of the many protocols myself and the rest of the divers on our oil rig have to follow. I don't question it because it's not my place. My place is doing the job I am hired to do, and that's to jump in the water and make sure everything is going smoothly below the surface. The North Sea is well known for its cold waters, so it's very noticeable when it starts to heat up. The dry suits we wear to dive in this part of the world are designed to protect us from the chillier temperatures. I'm working on inspecting the upper part of the rig's umbilical tube that descends to the ocean floor and extracts the oil. It's pretty standard for my work on the rig, but then something unusual happens. I start to feel myself getting warm. The water is not just getting warm though, it's getting hot. It feels like I'm suddenly in the middle of a sauna, sweating out all of the fluids in my body. Even with the protection of my suit, it's really starting to hurt. I speak into my headset, knowing that the crew can hear me above. Things are getting a little hot down here. Reel me in. I'm swimming upward, but I'm not moving nearly as fast as I need to. If I don't get out of the water now, I might be cooked alive down there. I can feel the crew on the rig start to pull on my line, but it's taking longer than I'd like. I'm starting to feel faint from the intensity of the heat all around me. It's overwhelming, starting to burn me inside of my diving suit. Reel me in! I'm panicking now, shouting louder than I mean to, but I don't care. Pull me up, now! Get me out of here right now! I look down into the depths below me and can see some of the water bubbling up from the sheer heat. Something catches my eye far beneath me a strange flicker of light down in the vast darkness down there. It's red and orange, almost like a flame. I've got to just be seeing things in my panic. The crew on the rig above are finally towing me now, but I'm definitely ascending much quicker than I should be. My body is reacting to the sudden changes in pressures coming over me. My ears pop and ring loudly, deafening me to even my own heavy breaths within my visor. My head spins and I suddenly feel the urge to vomit, but I hold it in, not wanting to share my helmet with my own puke. I feel a great wave of relief wash over me when I reach the surface. Steam is rising off of my dry suit and clouding up my visor as I ascend up to the rig to the waiting crew. They all look pretty concerned when they get me onto the rig. I recognize some of my crew surrounding me. They try to pry my helmet off, but seem to be having some difficulty. Damon reaches for the locks on my helmet, but flinches away when he touches it, letting out a yelp of pain. He shakes his hand, blowing some air on his fingers. Ow! It's hot! Really hot! Get the thing off of him, will you? Park shouts out, pulling out some pliers. He starts to pry my helmet off. I'm trying! Damon yells back. Old man Mallory, the man that's been working on the rig longer than anyone else, just starts rambling like he always does at the sight of me. It starts with the heat and then the heat keeps on rising. He's not exactly helpful standing there babbling incoherently, but his days of being useful are probably long behind him. It's hard for me to even focus on my crew. I just stand there, trying my best not to fall over. It's hard to focus on the crew. My body is overtaken by the bends. A great surge of fatigue takes hold of me and nearly brings me to my knees. It takes every ounce of energy I have to keep standing. Sweat falls into my eyes, but I can't wipe it away yet. Not until they get my helmet off of me. They manage to free my head from the dry suit and I breathe in the fresh air again, taking in as deep of breaths as I can. Steam rises from the diving suit I'm wearing and I see even more of it coming off of the helmet at my feet. Are you all right? Damon asks. When he tries to touch my shoulder, he immediately recoils away from how hot it is. Damn, you dive into a volcano or something? It starts with the heat. Mallory mumbles again, only to get guided away by Park. I'm fine, I gasp out. Case of the bends, probably, Damon says. We brought you up too quickly. It didn't feel like it was too quickly. 
If I got up here any slower, I might have melted in my own diving suit. I look over the side of the railing at the water below us. There's little bubbles foaming at the water's surface. A short while later, I'm getting looked over for any possible injuries. Our medical officer on the rig, Dr. Harris, examines me. You got those burns in the water? Yeah. You know when you see a lobster in a boiling pot? That was me for a minute or two. Scary. I could never do what you guys do. It's even worse for the saturation team down on the floor, isn't it? Definitely, I say. I love diving, but I wouldn't be able to spend a month at a time down there without coming back up. I like being just close enough to surface if I have to, like today. If that's all, Doc, I really got to get to the boss and report what happened. Do I have a clean bill of health? You've got my seal of approval. Go tell Kirk what happened. I move across the various walkways of the rig, occasionally glancing at the sea. It's getting harder and harder to see it. A thick layer of fog has now surrounded the whole facility and it just seems to be getting worse. I need to report what I experienced down in the water. Our superiors are very firm about that. They want to know about every spike in temperature in the water, especially the intense ones. My superiors have been a bit spooked about that lately, ever since the incident three weeks ago. One of our repair drones we deployed into the water came back almost completely melted. By the time we reeled it back up to the surface, the machine was almost goop and its systems liquefied. No one was sure what exactly happened to cause the drone to melt like it did, but I could see that my boss knew more than he was telling us. Kirk Allardyce always seems to know more than he lets on. You all know what you need to know. Kirk always says that, and it bothers me every time. Whatever he knows about the temperature fluctuations could probably be really helpful to all of us, especially the divers. We are the ones that go into the water, not him. I'm not messing around this time though, not when I almost just got boiled alive down there. That was way too close for comfort. I'm going to report it just like I'm supposed to, and I'm going to give him a piece of my mind too. Kirk sits in his office like always. I don't know the last time he had to go anywhere near the water, let alone actually dive down into it. That's just the way of things. The people making the decisions are the people that aren't putting their own lives at risk. His brown hair is slicked back, held at bay by all of the expensive products he puts in it. He's got a tie strapped around his neck like always, always dressing in a way that reminds people of who is in charge. He's not the rest of us, and he wants us to always remember that. Can I help you? He asks when he looks up at me. I'm not even sure that he knows my name. I don't think Kirk cares enough to learn any of his crew's names. To him, we're just tools that are helping him make his money. We make sure that the rig is working and we keep the oil flowing from the ocean floor. And that's all that Kirk Allardyce actually cares about. He doesn't offer me a seat or anything, so I just awkwardly stand in the doorway. Boss, you told us to let you know if we experienced any more of the water out there heating up. I did, he says. And? Are you here to submit a report? I nod. I am. I was just out there doing a dive in the water around me. I wipe some of the sweat off of my brow just to emphasize my point. Water started to get real hot out there, sir. Felt like I was being cooked alive. If I hadn't gotten out when I did, I might have been. Kirk just offers a little nod, taking in the information before shrugging his shoulders. Okay then, thank you for bringing that to my attention. He turns back to the papers on his desk. I stand there for a moment, waiting for him to say something else, but he doesn't. He looks up and seems surprised that I'm still there. Is there something else? I'm not in the mood to play games or have him be vague about whatever just happened to me. It happened to me, not him. I should be given at least some information about what's going on. I decided to be upfront about it. What is going on? What do you mean? The fact he can even ask that with a straight face is infuriating. He knows more than he's telling us, and he needs to start talking. The heat in the water, the thing that happened to that drone, 
You know more about it, don't you? Kirk laughs a little, <laughs> and his face starts to grow red with some annoyance. I do, eh? What gives you that impression? Just a gut feeling. Well, your gut is clearly off then, because I only know just as much as the rest of you. One of the drones melted down there, and I'm just trying to respond to that properly and make sure everyone is all right. The safety and security of everyone on this rig is always of the utmost importance to me. It sounds so disingenuous when he says it. It's like a rehearsed response, something to tell the press instead of something that he actually means. He's always so distant from the rest of the crew, and this just proves it even more. You tell us to report to you any heat increases and any different lights that we see down in the water. If you only know as much as we do, then what's with the light? What are you looking for down there? Obviously any saboteurs. I'm just trying to keep you all safe. Just keep doing your jobs and stick to the parameters and the protocols that we have in place. I appreciate you reporting your incident. Keep it up. I stay in the doorway. There's more I should report. Go on, spit it out. I saw something else down there. It was a light. It looked like fire. For a moment, I see a flash of uneasiness go across his face, but he composes himself. Fire? Down beneath the surface? Have you gotten your medical check with Dr. Harris yet? He's trying to write me off, to brush what I saw aside. He wants to chalk it up to there being something wrong with me. I'm not going to let it be that easy, though. I have. He gave me a clean bill of health. Kirk shakes his head. Then I suggest you have him give you a second look. He turns away again, laughing off what I said. Fire in the ocean. You need to have him really give your head a look. I know what I saw, even if my boss doesn't want to believe me. I need to talk to someone that will actually listen to what I'm saying, someone that I can trust. The person I'm closest with on the rig is someone that typically spends a lot of time away from me. Tyler Altman works as one of the saturation divers for the rig. They spend weeks at a time down at the ocean floor, living in a pressurized chamber. They work on any maintenance and repairs to the lower umbilical tube of the rig, making sure that its collection of oil from the sea floor is running smoothly. Staying down there at that depth is just easier than constantly coming back up to the surface. The pressure way down there is dangerous enough and should be done as little as possible. I don't know how Tyler and the other saturation divers do it. I just don't want to spend week after week after week at the literal bottom of the ocean my dives that I undertake are more than enough for me. I would hate not being able to come up to the surface and get some much needed fresh air. We might not see each other much when Tyler is down there with the other two saturation divers, but we keep in touch through the radio. He's my best friend out in the ocean and the kind of person that helps ease my mind when I talk to him. And that's exactly what I need right now. I click on the receiver. Top side to underdweller, you copy? I hear you loud and clear, Topside. Tyler's voice says. Beautiful sunset, isn't it? <laughs> we both laugh. The truth is, Tyler hasn't seen the sun in weeks. The saturation divers live so far down with nothing but darkness around them. The sun's rays can't reach those depths. A beautiful evening, yeah. I'm already feeling a little bit better. Was hoping to talk to you. Didn't have a great conversation with Kirk today. Color me unsurprised. Has anyone ever had an actual good talk with that asshole? Fair. What did you even need to talk to him for? I did a dive earlier. Tyler starts chuckling <laughs> on the other end of the radio. Can you even call it a dive? He always gives me grief about that. My dives don't go to the depths that he does. Kitty pool. Will you let me finish? You're just dipping your toes in the shallow end. Tyler, come on. He just keeps laughing, but finally composes himself. All right, all right, carry on. What happened? Things got hot during the dive. Really hot. Ah, I see. So you had to report it to Kirk. And I'm sure he didn't take it seriously, right? Exactly. I get that. I had to talk to him today, too. We just reported that we saw a strange light down here this morning. 
with how deep we are down here. You tend to notice those kinds of things. What was it? No idea. It didn't stick around very long. It was red and orange. Almost looked like... like fire. Fire at the bottom of the ocean. Just like what I saw on my dive. I think I saw something similar when I was being reeled in. I thought I was just imagining things, but I guess not. You reported it to Kirk? Yeah. He didn't seem that interested in it, though. Asked me if maybe we had been down here too long. He even suggested that we might be suffering from pressure-induced psychosis. That sounds like Kirk. I'm already mad that he ignored what I had said about the flame. And it's even worse that another person corroborated the same story. And he still ignored them and treated them like they were losing their minds. Our boss is trying to gaslight all of us into thinking that we are just seeing things that aren't there. Maybe when you're back up here, we can talk to him together. He might listen to a combined effort. <laughs> Tyler laughs. I doubt it, but we can give it our best shot. I'm excited to come back up and see the sun again. That's what's helping me get through this. How many more days do you have before you're all brought back up? At this point, two days left. Then I'm going to take a nice long rest before the next dive. As you should, man. I say, and I mean it. Tyler and his crew deserve a break from being that deep in the ocean, spending weeks down in the dark. If you need to talk again, you know where to find me. Soon, we'll be able to have these chats of ours in person again. I'm looking forward to it. You got it. Thanks, Underdweller. Anytime, Topside. I go for a walk around the rig to get some fresh air, something that I never take for granted. I spend so much time in a place where I can't breathe without support, so it's nice to just be able to inhale and exhale normally. I stare out into the fog and to what I can see of the water. I'm looking for the light, for the flame down there to show itself. I now know I wasn't the only one that saw it down there. Tyler and his crew saw it too. I didn't imagine it, no matter what my boss says. I turn when I hear someone behind me and find old man Mallory standing there, also looking out at the water. I'm not even sure that he notices me at first. His stare is always so vacant, like he's seeing something else entirely, like he's still back in another time. He whispers just loud enough for me to hear. He always rises. I don't usually bother to hear what the old man has to say, and I'm not the only one. No one listens to Mallory. He's been a mainstay of the rig for decades. Everyone always jokes about how he's been on it so long that his blood has turned black from all of the oil that he's drummed up from the depths. He spent longer at sea than anyone else on board the rig, and no one would argue that. It's just a fact. Everyone just assumes the isolation of being in the middle of the ocean has gotten to his aging mind. It's easy to come to that conclusion with how senile he seems. Half the time, it's like he's out of his mind and not aware of what's around him. He's always muttering to himself. That's nothing new. Something about the way he's talking this time is different though. Or maybe almost boiling alive in the water has made me hear him differently. What do you mean by that? He seems to ignore my question. I was here during the fire, you know. The oil spill disaster on the rig in 1988. I know all about it. Mostly because this old man always tells us about being there for it. It took the company a long time to recover from what happened then. And we now work on the same rig where it happened all those decades ago. It's something that everyone on the crew is at least somewhat aware of even if we don't usually get a lot of the details. At the very least, everyone knows Mallory was there. You've told me before, Mallory, you've told us all. He still doesn't seem to hear me. He's just speaking out to the void, like he's reminding the ocean itself. Hottest I've ever been, but it wasn't the fire that burned brightest that night. It was the thing that lit the place on fire, that lit so many of my friends on fire. The thing that lit the place on fire. I always heard it was just an accident. That there wasn't a person or thing that caused it. What do you mean by that? What lit the place on fire? Oh, shh, shh. 
He suddenly puts a dirty, oil-stained finger to his mouth with one hand and clasps his palm over my own mouth with his other hand. Listen to me. Listen. It started with the heat. It rises. It always rises. Then there was the fire. We aren't supposed to talk about it. It wasn't supposed to ever wake up again, but I can feel it stirring under us. It's been waking up for a while now. We thought that we killed it by putting it down there. But the heat always rises. I'm mesmerized, just listening to every word. The things that come out of his mouth are usually so incoherent. And maybe this is too. But for some reason, I'm really listening to what he's saying. And it almost sounds like wisdom. That evil thing, it's supposed to stay down there where it can't. Where it can't burn anyone. We drowned it. We extinguished it. I managed to jangle his hand off of my mouth with a few swings of my head. I need more information, even if he doesn't want to speak. What? You extinguished what? He gives a nervous little laugh. His eyes are wide with remembrance and fear. The flame. The one that sets even the seas ablaze. My mind thinks back to that flicker of fire I saw down in the water, so far below me. What are you talking about? When he finally turns away from the foggy sea and looks into my eyes, I see some terror in his own stare. His eyes have seen something awful. There's no doubt about that. The doused. I always knew it would come back. A fire like that. You can't just snuff it out. It just needed more fuel. And now it's growing again. It's rising. You felt the touch of its heat. You felt it. We all will. Tuesday nights might not be enough anymore. Tonight, no, we have to keep it dim. The doused is rising again, just like before. It needs to burn. It needs to devour. We need to give it more. Without saying another word, Mallory walks away and leaves me at the railing. I'm left to just look out into the haze of fog. I keep trying to find that flame in the water, but it's nowhere to be seen. The hours go by like any other, like it's a perfectly normal day, until I find myself back on my hammock for the night. I can't sleep tonight. I just keep hearing Mallory's words bouncing around in my skull. The things that he was talking about, it all seems so real to him. He really believes that something evil is coming. Maybe it is. How else would he also know about the flame I saw? Maybe the senile old man makes more sense than anyone believes. The doused. That's what he called it. If there really is some horrible thing down in the water, something that we're supposed to be keeping down there, I need to know more. He mentioned Tuesday night. It sticks out to me because Tuesdays are already different from most days on the rig. Tuesday reminds me of the many strange rules on the rig that everyone has to follow. One of the rules is every Tuesday night, we all have to remain in our quarters. We aren't allowed to leave our rooms or go outside until a signal has been sounded. Only those who have clearance for it are able to be out during the three hours we always have to wait. But those people never talk about what transpires. They probably are sworn to secrecy. It's always been something I'm curious about, but maybe it's time to actually find out what happens on Tuesdays. And tonight, is the perfect night, since it's that time of the week. I crawl out of my hammock and slip past the rest of the crew that's sleeping in the quarters. I'm quiet when I pry the metal door open, making sure to be careful closing it behind me. I make my way out into the night, and the cloud of fog still shrouds the entire oil rig. At least the fog might help to hide my face from anyone that's allowed to be out there. I know I'm breaking the rules, and I know that I'm not supposed to be there. But I need to know what Mallory meant. I need to know what happens every Tuesday night. I stand behind some crates and watch the main platform of the rig. Kirk is standing there by the railing. It's strange to see my boss on the actual platform and not sitting around in his stuffy office. I've rarely ever seen him walking around the rig. That alone makes me immediately suspicious. A small fishing vessel is being guided into dock beside the rig. 
The people on board make their way up the platform steps until they reach Kirk. The crew of fishermen are obvious enough with their wool caps and thick sweaters, but I'm more concerned about what they have brought with them. There are four people standing with the new arrivals that don't look like the others. Their heads are covered by burlap sacks and their wrists are bound with rope. I can hear them groaning and sobbing beneath the bags pulled over them. From the sounds of it, their mouths are gagged and they can't speak. A man in a long leather trench coat and a captain's hat shakes hands with Kirk and the two stand at the edge of the platform with the crew and the four apparent prisoners. I carefully sneak over to hide behind a nearby barrel just to get within earshot of the conversation. It's starting to get more restless. It's even manifesting. Some of my divers are seeing flames down there. The captain strokes his beard and thought, That's very, very bad, Allardyce. These offerings are even more important then. I know, Kirk says. But it's nothing that we can't handle, right? It just needs more. We'll start dropping two additional overboard. Maybe that will satiate it. For how long? I don't know. But we don't have much choice here, Captain. Kirk motions toward the people with their heads obscured by the burlap sacks. Hopefully, these ones will be enough for now. The captain nods. We can only pray. Members of the fishing crew shove the four prisoners forward until they are at the very edge of the platform. Their cries of panic grow louder beneath their shrouds. The fishermen tie more rope around the prisoners' ankles now. Kirk speaks to them with very little empathy. I know this must be confusing, but you have been given a great honor. It is only through our hard work and your sacrifice that we can protect this world from what wishes to turn it all to ash. The sea douses it, and we keep it from regaining its fire. You have been given an incredible purpose in this life. Thank you for your sacrifice. The captain pulls out a knife and rolls up his sleeve, cutting his own arm. Kirk touches the wound with a finger and begins to draw a strange symbol on the burlap sacks. It doesn't look like anything I recognize. Once he finishes anointing one of the prisoners with the blood, Kirk suddenly shoves them. The first prisoner tips over the side of the platform, tumbling down into the black water below. I rush to the railing and watch the bound man hit the surface of the water. With his wrists and ankles tied up, he doesn't have a chance to even try to swim. He just sinks beneath the surface and disappears into the darkness. But then I see him again, bursting into flames in the water. Kirk makes the same symbol in blood on the next person's shrouded face. Once he's done, Kirk shoves the second prisoner. No! I shout before I can stop myself. Everyone on the platform is startled by my interruption, but after glaring in my direction, my boss finishes pushing the next prisoner anyway. I watch them plummet into the depths. A new fireball appears just below the surface as the person burns. Kirk prepares to push the final two prisoners, but I start shrieking. No! What the hell are you doing? Help! Stop him! I can't stand to see him kill anyone else. My screams echo across the platform. The sleeping crew that are forced to stay inside can probably hear it. I'm suddenly surrounded by a couple of the rig crew and a couple fishermen that all grab hold of me and drag me over to where the sacrifices are taking place. I see the two remaining prisoners throw themselves over the side of the platform without being anointed. Kirk reaches out to try to stop them, but he's too late. They fall into the sea. Strangely, they don't catch fire down there like the previous two did. They just sink and disappear into the tides. Kirk swears under his breath, looking down at the water before pointing his bloody finger at me. Do you have any idea what you just did? I didn't really, but I could see how angry my boss was with me. Should we just toss him over with the others? The sea captain suggests. Maybe that will make up for it. My boss seems to consider it for a moment before shaking his head. He grabs hold of my collar, leering at me. No, it's too late for that. We'll see you and your men next Tuesday, Captain. Bring two extra prisoners. Maybe we'll accept them. My boss practically throws me into his office. I'm still trying to make sense of everything I just saw. The people with sacks over their heads, the symbols drawn in blood, 
the bodies catching fire once they submerged in the sea. What was that? I ask, my voice shaking. What did you do to them? Kirk runs his hand down his face. You again. What do you think you are doing out at this hour on a Tuesday night? You know the rules we have in place. There's a reason that we have those. Do you think that you don't have to follow the rules like everyone else? Do you think that you're above them? No, boss, I say. I just was curious, I guess. Curious, Kirk says with a smug little laugh. That's all? Yes, sir. I just figured that if we're all working here, then we should have an idea of what's going on around us. You don't have the faintest idea what your interruption might have cost us. No, so tell me. If it doesn't pertain to your specific job, then why do you need to know what doesn't concern you? You're a maintenance diver. Your job is to make sure that this rig stays standing and that things down there are operating properly. Outside of that, it's not your concern. You broke one of our most important rules tonight. Breaking rules on a rig like this, that puts all of us at risk. But you're a good diver. That's the only reason that I might not fire you right here and now. Kirk Allardyce takes a long breath, then shakes his head. What did you see tonight? I know he's waiting for a very specific answer from me. If I don't give him what he wants, he'll fire me or set me on fire just like those poor people. Nothing. That's right, nothing. Nothing that anyone on this rig would believe if you told them. And if I find out that you did blab about what Tuesday nights are for, you'll get a much closer look at what you wanted to see. Now get the hell out of my office. I never want to see you out on a night like this ever again. Is that clear? Yeah. I get up and start to leave, but stop at the door. The doused. That's what it's called, right? Kirk looks legitimately surprised. Where did you hear that? Mallory told me. <laughs> Kirk scoffs, but I can see that he's actually flustered. Mallory's just an old man. He says the craziest things. Sure, of course. Suddenly, Mallory doesn't seem so crazy anymore. What is it? What's down there? Something that needs to stay down there. That's all you need to know. Just keep doing your job and make sure this rig stays standing. I want to ask him more. I want to know who those people were that he pushed off the platform, but I know that would be pushing it too far. I don't want to give him any reason to do the same to me. I need to talk to Tyler. He's the only one that can maybe make me feel a little bit better about all of it. He's the only one that will be able to calm me down. I grab hold of the radio transceiver and click on it. Underdweller, this is Topside, do you copy? I wait a moment and Tyler's voice doesn't respond. I try again. Underdweller, this is Topside, can you hear me? There's nothing. I take a long, deep breath. Even if he's busy and can't hear me, I need to say something. I just need to speak it aloud to get it out of my system. Even if he can't hear me, at least it will be said. Tyler. I just needed to talk to you, man. That's all. I got into some trouble up here last night. I... I finally found out what Tuesday night lockdowns actually are, and... It's not good. I can't really say much more than that. My voice cracks, and I can't hold myself back from choking up. I'm completely overcome by the confusion and the fear. I hold the trembling transceiver up to my mouth. I need you up here, Ty. It's not good. It's really... I click off the radio and just cry. <laughs> Luckily, the saturation divers will finally be brought back up soon. When I go back to my hammock and sleep finally takes me, I have horrible dreams. I'm standing on the edge of the platform on the oil rig. My hands and feet are tied together by rope. There is fire all around me because the ocean isn't water anymore. It's an inferno of rolling waves of flame. It's okay, Topside. I turn and find Tyler standing behind me. He's smiling like he usually does, but his whole body is on fire. His skin is melting off his bones. He doesn't seem to notice. He just keeps grinning at me until there's just the permanent smile of his skull. He still speaks as he burns away, but the voice doesn't sound like him. It's deeper, 
more guttural. He puts his immolated hand on my chest. It just needs more kindling. It just needs to feed. He pushes me and I fall from the platform, down into the sea of flames. I wake up screaming. My hammock is soaking my own sweat and maybe even some tears. It's like everything old man Mallory said found its way into my dreams. Damon taps me, looking concerned. You all right? Sounded like one hell of a nightmare. I don't know what to even say in my exasperation, so I lie. Yeah, I'm fine. Good. They're bringing up the sat divers early. They haven't had contact with them since yesterday and they're not responding. I think back to my failed call with Tyler. I couldn't reach them either. Worry takes hold of me as I remember an image from my dream. Tyler's skull grinning at me through the flames engulfing him. When are they bringing them up? Right now. I get out to the platform just as the crane finishes setting the large pressurized chamber down. Everyone gathers around it like they always do. It's always exciting to see our friends again after one of their month long dives. Even Kirk has left his office and graced us with his presence. I used to just find him irritating, but after the other night, now I see him in a much more unsettling light. He's a killer, a murderer. I'm going to tell Tyler all about what happened. He'll know what to do. It takes the crew a little to unbolt the front door of the chamber and pry it open. The smell hits us first. A lot of the crew start coughing and gagging once the stench reaches our nostrils. It smells like cooked meat. There are three bodies, all black and red, charred. Their skin is melted off of their bones. Their bodies are brittle and nearly turned to ash from whatever burned them. I push my way to the front, nearly shoving Kirk aside when he tries to get in my way. Tyler! Ty! I know he won't hear my shouts. He's too far gone. Tyler almost looks like he did in my nightmare. Maybe my dream was more than just a dream. Maybe I was being shown something. It can't be a coincidence. I saw him burning in my head, and now here he is, burned to death. How is this even possible? Damon asks. The chamber looks undamaged. If there was a fire somehow, there should be some other sign besides the crew down there. Anything at all. But there's nothing. It's like the three of them just spontaneously combusted. He's not wrong. This isn't normal. This is on you, Kirk whispers to me. If you just let us finish the offering, it wouldn't have needed to take someone else. I don't know what to say. Instead, I look out at the shroud of mist around our rig. It's not just fog, it's steam. The ocean surrounding us is boiling. I turn and find old man Mallory standing behind me. He looks nervous. No, more than that, he looks utterly petrified. The heat keeps rising. Next comes the fire. The old man shakes. His eyes are wide with fear. He puts a sweaty hand on my shoulder. We're all going to burn. I believe him. I stare at my friend's charred corpse until I can't any longer. Tyler didn't deserve to die like this. No one does. He should still be alive. Finally coming up for air after a month of being down in the depths with his crew of saturation divers. He was so excited to come back, but I never could have imagined he would be back like this. It's all because of my boss keeping secrets about this rig and what is in the water. He should have warned us all about what we should expect here, but he didn't. Kirk Allardyce let people like me keep diving down there. He made it seem like these heat fluctuations are nothing to be concerned about, but it's all a lie. We should never have been working on this oil rig without knowing the full truth about what is beneath us. Some ancient evil. A flame burning at the bottom of the sea. There's something down there, in the water. I'm shouting before I even realize what I'm doing. I'm addressing the crew around me directly trying to find anyone that will listen. They need to know the truth about this place, even if I don't know the full story. There's fire down there. Kirk knows about it. Mallory does too. Kirk was even killing people to try to keep it down there. Kirk grabs my arm. He shouts at me, but mostly to play to the crowd of onlookers. 
Will you get a hold of yourself? Do you hear what you're saying? You sound insane. I don't shout back. Being hysterical will just help his defense. No, I make sure that I sound like I'm more reasonable than the two of us, because I am. I want my coworkers to see it. We both know that I'm not insane. Kirk gives a very <laughs> fake, performative laugh. Then why are you talking about all of this nonsense? Fire in the water? Me killing people? Because there is fire in the water, and you did kill people. Last night, human sacrifices to appease whatever terrible thing is beneath us. The doused, right? Whatever that is, you are killing people for it. You're clearly hysterical, he says, running his hand through his slicked back hair to regain his composure. He turns away from me and instead focuses on the crew of onlookers. They are all visibly confused and scared after seeing what happened to the saturation divers. I need them to see what's going on here, but Kirk is already ahead of me, and his word means more to his employees than mine does. Whatever happened down there was an unfortunate accident, that's all. We will give these poor souls a proper burial soon, and I promise you all that we will figure out what went wrong with this. Until then, I need it to be business as usual. Everyone, back to work. The crowd of people watching all mutter to one another, but then slowly start to disperse. I call out for them to stay, but none of them want to. They're following the instructions of the man that cuts their paychecks. It unfortunately makes sense for them to back down. Kirk waits for everyone to be out of earshot before he speaks to me again. He keeps his voice down, ensuring that I'm the only one that hears. You didn't need to cause a scene. Of course I did. It's because of you that this even happened. Me? No. It was because of you interrupting the weekly sacrifice that this happened. We haven't had an incident like this until now. It's never been robbed of one of its offerings until last night. You did that, remember? That's on you. My boss points a finger threateningly at me, like he's daring me to keep talking. When I don't speak up again, he rolls his eyes and walks away. I hope he's not right. I hope I didn't cause Tyler's death by breaking the rules of the rig. I wasn't supposed to leave my quarters last night, and instead, I stopped a couple of those people from being marked and sacrificed like they were supposed to be. Even though I interrupted the ritual, those people still drowned in the sea, so I didn't even save them. Would killing them properly, with that symbol on their faces, have actually saved Tyler and the other saturation divers? I push that question aside because I can't consider it. I don't want to be responsible for their deaths, but maybe I am. I look over the rig's railing and I peer down through the layer of fog into the depths, still looking for the flame that I saw last time I was down there, which was the apparent source of so much pain and suffering. If Mallory is right, the death of Tyler and the other saturation divers is just the beginning. The thing down there, the thing he called the doused is going to try to set the whole ocean on fire, starting with us. I walk into the medical bay to find Dr. Harris standing over the three charred corpses. They are laid out on the examination table, still steaming a little. It's hard to see Tyler that way. I didn't know the other saturation divers, Jacobs and Pope, as well as I knew him, but they didn't deserve to die such horrible deaths either. I just don't get it, the doctor says when he sees me. How did they sustain these kinds of burns when the chamber they were in showed no other signs of a fire? It's not a normal fire. Whatever it is, I saw people fall into the water and then just burst into flames once they were submerged. It's not science. It's something else. Harris shakes his head. Not science, eh? So what are we talking about then? Are we talking about hellfire? He lets out a nervous laugh, but I don't laugh with him. Hellfire might not be a bad guess. Maybe, honestly, I say. It's something very old and very bad. Dr. Harris isn't convinced. Someone who dedicates their life to understanding the rational things that can happen to the human body 
will always look for logical explanations. There isn't one for this. I know you and Tyler were close, he says. I'm sure this is very difficult for you. There is no way for the doctor to fully comprehend how difficult it actually is. He doesn't understand how hard it is to know the truth, but have no one believe you. The people around me that work on the rig should also be questioning all of the weird rules we have, but they all just want to get their work done and get paid. The things you were saying outside, and what you're going on about now, Dr. Harris says quietly, like he's afraid someone will hear him. What did you mean by all of that? Fire in the ocean? Ancient evil? Human sacrifices? It's just like I said. The people that run this rig sacrifice people on Tuesday nights, when most of us are restricted to our quarters. They perform a ritual. A fishing boat brings over prisoners, and Kirk draws weird symbols and blood on their faces before dropping them into the water. You do realize how crazy that sounds, right? I'm very aware, but believe me, there is something awful in the water, and Mallory's right. It's rising up to us. Our attention is drawn to the bodies laid out before us. A small flame suddenly sparks on Tyler's burnt body. Dr. Harris flinches at the sight of it and steps back. What the hell? The doctor regains his composure and approaches the bodies with some curiosity as the flames start to spread up Tyler's charred arm. What's going on? I ask. I haven't the faintest idea, Dr. Harris says as he leans over the corpse to get a better look. Perhaps there were still some embers, so to speak, that have been exposed to enough oxygen to ignite. Tyler's flaming arm suddenly jolts upward and his burnt fingers wrap around the doctor's throat. Harris screams as the flames grow in size, engulfing the rest of Tyler's body. The bodies of Jacobs and Pope spontaneously ignite at the same time, and they sit up from where they're laying on the table. The fire covering Tyler's body spreads to the doctor he's choking. Harris shrieks when the blaze engulfs him completely. I scramble in the room, keeping my distance from the moving corpses and the growing fire until I find the fire extinguisher under the cabinet. I spray its contents all over the fire in an attempt to put it out, but the flames seem completely unaffected. Those moving, burning dead men just stand there and all start laughing in unison. They are apparently loving my futile attempt. You can't snuff me out, a strange voice says, speaking through all of their mouths simultaneously. Not anymore. You're only prolonging the inevitable. You're going to burn, just like they did. Nothing but ash. All of you. Kindling, 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 kindling. The bodies start to fall apart, too burned to keep themselves together. I see what's left of Tyler crumble into a burning pile of bone and ash. Whatever the doused is, it burns right through a human being. I stumble out of the medical bay after putting out some of the remaining flames. If the crew on the rig didn't believe me before, they will have to believe me now. People are being possessed and combusting. I just wish that some others were in the medical bay with me to actually see what happened. It's obvious they don't trust my word alone. Thankfully, some people saw smoke coming out of the medical bay and are here to see what is happening. They missed the most important part, but I think the remains on the floor get the point across. This is insane, Damon says, looking at the damage done to the medical bay. An active fire on the rig could blow us all sky high if we're not careful. That's true. Everyone working on the platform knows that any source of flame is forbidden. Matches, lighters, candles, cigarettes, anything flammable is banned as one of the most important rules. Unfortunately for us, the living flame beneath us probably doesn't care about the rules. Park shakes his head while he stands beside old man Mallory. None of this should be happening. There hasn't been anything out of the ordinary here. That you were aware of, Mallory says. I have been trying to tell all of you the truth. It starts with the heat, and then comes the fire. Damon brushes the elderly man's words away, just like he always does, just like they all always have. I used to do it too. None of us ever took Mallory's ramblings seriously. And even now, I'm the only one that does. I don't know what's true and what's not, Damon says. 
but you need to sort this out with the boss. We need some kind of explanation, and we'll figure it out from there. Of course they want me to speak with Kirk while they stay behind. None of them want to lose their jobs, so they aren't willing to say anything directly. It's up to me. I'd gladly let myself be fired if it means saving everyone else from the real fire. I try to appease my co-workers. Hopefully, they'll listen from now on so I can get them all away from the thing that's already hurting us. I'm going to talk to Kirk and get some real answers. I glance out at the sea surrounding us. The fog is still thick, but I can hear the ocean simmering and boiling. It's getting worse. The fire down there is getting hotter, and its influence has clearly reached us. With Tyler dead, I'm done letting Kirk keep things under wraps. It's time to expose all of it. The first thing that needs to happen is for him to admit the truth about all of it. When I burst into his office, he's sitting at his desk again, and looks irritated to have to see me again. We've spoken more in the last 48 hours than ever before, and Kirk probably hates it. What do you want now? You're going to tell me everything. Am I? Yes, because I just watched all three of the dead saturation divers sit up and catch on fire and start talking. They killed Dr. Harris. If you want to actually fix this, you're going to have to start being honest with me. He seems genuinely surprised. Dr. Harris is dead? He is. He burned up just like the others. Come on, we can't just keep trying to keep this quiet. That thing down there, it's here and it's starting to hurt the people that work for you. I'm not asking for much. I just want some kind of explanation so I know what we're up against. Kirk hesitates, but I see him start to relent. He runs his fingers through his slick, gelled hair. All right, fine. It's not like I have much choice now anyway. I was hoping that I'd be able to make it through my tenure managing this rig without anything going wrong. Tuesday nights were supposed to be the only nights when I'd even have to really think about this. I don't feel any sympathy for him. He's been keeping all of us in the dark, and now some of his employees have died horribly because of it. Out here in the middle of the North Sea, we should be able to trust each other, but my boss was working behind our backs the whole time. Decades ago, this rig woke something up down there, just before the incident in 1988. I wasn't there at the time, obviously, but I was more than brought up to speed about it when I was hired. Kirk unlocks a drawer in his desk and pulls out a thick manual. He plops it onto the desk. Managing this rig comes with a lot of duties and protocols and much more responsibility than most jobs would ever require. You aren't the only one that has to follow rules and make sure everything is in order. If I falter, if I slip up, I could cause the end of the world as we know it. That's what this job is really about. I take it all in. I can see how serious he is. I've hardly ever seen Kirk keep eye contact as long as he is doing now. And the human sacrifices? Those people? Kirk's expression grows grave, but then he shrugs. How would you think about placating some ancient god? It seemed like the best thing to do at the time. He taps the thick stack of pages in front of him. I'm just following the manual's instructions. The Tuesday night deliveries were already in place when I took the job. The symbols, the blood, it's all laid out right here. I think they got it from some old book when they were trying to get rid of the doused back then. To be honest, no one really knows if those sacrifices satisfied the thing, but it seemed like it worked and no one dared to stop. I don't dare to either. He might have been killing those people for no reason. First off, I didn't kill those people. I can't help but laugh and roll my eyes. Oh, of course not. He just gave them a gentle nudge and fed them to something terrible. He still might have been kidnapping and sacrificing innocent people for it not to help at all. Maybe, he says, but maybe not. Either way, we've lived this long thanks in part to those offerings. I'm sure of it. Well, those people you killed didn't seem to be enough. Kirk runs his hands through his slick hair in frustration, his anger flaring up. They would have been if you hadn't broken the rules and come outside that night. Your interference is what got your friend killed. 
The saturation team was burned because you upset the doused by interrupting the offering. It's because of you that your friend burned down there. I nearly leap across the desk when he says that, but I just managed to hold myself back. Of course, Kirk blames me for what happened, but that doesn't mean it's true. I'm not the one that has killed people in ritual sacrifice. I'm not the one keeping secrets and putting everyone on this rig at risk. My boss is sweating. A few beads of perspiration roll down his brow and he wipes them away with the back of his hand. Maybe the things I'm saying are really getting to him. And he's finally feeling some pressure and some responsibility for his terrible actions. His collared shirt is starting to show dark patches of dampness too, sweating right through the fabric. He pulls at his necktie and loosens it while a layer of moisture keeps pouring down his face. It seems Kirk is finally realizing that he's in the hot seat and that he can't keep hiding behind all of the secrets. He's told me enough now to bring the news to the crew of the rig, and then he's really going to have to answer for all of it. You really, really should have just done your job. He fans himself with his hand, desperately trying to cool off. That's all. That's all you had to do. You should have stuck to focusing on your dives and not concern yourself with anything but the maintenance of the rig. That's when I see that it's more than just nervous sweating. Steam is rising off his skin. He's really struggling to speak. He looks like he's ready to pass out. All you had to do was follow the rules and not get in the way of the sacrifices of what needed, of what needed to be consumed. He closes his eyes and looks like he's passed out for a moment. When his eyes open again, he has a strange expression on his face. Kirk's hair ignites in a blaze of orange and red. The slicked back hair that he always puts so many care products on burns away in seconds. The flames eat away at the top of his brow, slowly working their way down his face. He doesn't look overwhelmed and fatigued anymore. He's grinning like he doesn't even notice that his head is on fire. There's a spark in his gaze that's never been there before, something that doesn't seem like him at all. I see him change right before my eyes. When Kirk speaks, his voice is suddenly hoarse and cracking, as if he's been smoking a pack of cigarettes a day for decades. His voice box seems like it's been scorched and his throat dried out. Maybe it has been. I just need fuel. I need to consume. It's not Kirk Allardyce anymore. My boss is gone. It's something else entirely sitting across from me. When it peers at me with those crazed, steaming eyes, I know that what I'm looking at is nothing even close to human. Something evil is lit inside of Kirk's body, and it's burning through him quickly with every passing moment. You're that thing down there, aren't you? The doused? The living fire, or whatever kind of monster this is, that's wearing Kirk's face keeps grinning with my boss's mouth, but it's clearly not the man that I knew. Is that what they call me? That's what I've heard. The thing's smile broadens even more, as more of the face around it keeps burning away. I like that. I like how presumptuous it is. How wrong it is. You humans always believe that you know everything. To think that you really believed something like me could so easily be extinguished. They managed to dampen you for a little while, didn't they? I was weakened by the currents below, yes. But I was never gone. With each soul they gave me to burn, I grew stronger. The fools only believed it enough to satiate me. I enjoyed seeing them turn on their own to appease me. There was some fun to be had, but now, after you interrupted the sacrifice, I realized that there's no point to laying any longer. It is time for me to exist fully, to be free. And what does your freedom look like? The thing flashes a terrible look of pure excitement. This world becomes a fire. I try my best to stay calm even though I'm watching my boss's body burn away little by little in front of me. The whole world? I ask. The doused nods with Kirk's head. I continue, just hoping to find some kind of way out of this horrible predicament. You can see why that might be a problem for us, and why we can't let that happen. Let me. It laughs at first. But then the flames burning away Kirk's head intensify and grow, practically roaring. It's furious and screaming. Kirk's dried up, inhuman voice echoes through the whole rig. 
I don't need the permission of a log to burn. When he shouts, flames from his burning head splash outward and land on the paperwork on the desk. The manager's manual goes up in a tower of flames in front of me as more fire spreads across the room. I am tired of waiting in water. I am tired of not being able to spread. I need to live, breathe, and thrive. This ocean cannot hold me anymore, and those measly offerings are not enough to appease me anymore. I know that reasoning with some ancient entity is probably not something that can be done, but I at least have to try. The lives of everyone on board the oil rig might be depending on me. There's nothing that we can do to fix this and get you back down there? The thing in front of me laughs, and more flames dance when it does. The fire spreading around me is growing more intense, hissing and swiping at me, making me sweat. I can't stay in this room much longer. It's like I'm looking directly into the sun, watching it melt away Kirk Allardyce from the inside out. The doused shakes Kirk's head. What little is left of his flesh. No, I want you all to drown just as I did. But you little things won't reignite. Not ever. The sea is already changing, bending to my will. I'm going to ignite it. The rig creaks and groans beneath me, then rocks hard. I'm thrown from the chair, but quickly climb to my feet when the thing laughs at me. I try to keep myself steady, then look up at the burning man in front of me. Kirk's lips melt away around his wide grin. When the doused opens its mouth to speak again, I see his tongue turning black and burning away inside. Yes, this is how it should be. The doused points Kirk's index finger at me. I touched you, remember? When you went down there, I let you know that I was there. You saw me down in the dark. I remember the overwhelming heat of my last dive and the small flame I saw flickering on the ocean floor. This is how it should be. You will all burn at the bottom of the sea, just as I did, but you will never rise again. There is shouting outside in the corridors, and I turn toward the door, rising out of my chair. The possessed man sitting across from me just keeps laughing with that dry, burned out voice. The rest of Kirk Allardyce bursts into flames. He's still cackling through the fire as I hurry out of the room. I hurry through the narrow hallways inside the rig as the whole place rattles and sways, sending me back and forth between the walls. It takes everything I have to keep my footing and not fall over, and I hear shouts outside. I reach the platform and everyone is pointing overboard. I run to the railing to see what's happening. The sea in every direction is bubbling and boiling violently now. Some of the bubbles pop and send scalding hot water at us. All of the metal around us is becoming too hot to touch. The entire rig is becoming a stovetop, but unlike kitchen appliances, our base is not built to be able to withstand intense heat. At least, not like this. What the hell is happening? Someone shouts. There's a scream across the platform, and I see one of the crewmen suddenly burst into flames, blindly flailing around the rig before falling over the railing into the boiling water. A worker closer to me has the same thing happen to him and then another person nearby lights up with him, both burning to death in front of everyone. My friend, Park, is standing beside me, shaking his head in disbelief. I don't understand! I don't understand! Park is cut off by a wince of pain, and he puts both hands on the sides of his head, clutching his skull in pain. He screeches in agony as his body suddenly disappears in a fireball, joining the others burning around us. The flames are consuming them all. No. The doused is consuming them all one by one, just like it said it would. It's going to burn us all and destroy the rig, and then it's going to spread to the rest of the planet. This world becomes a pyre. That's what it told me. The words echo in my mind while I see it start to actually happen. The support structures beneath the water's surface lose their foundations. They must be melting in the boiling sea. The platform careens hard, tipping in one direction. People slip down the length of the facility, desperately trying to grab hold of anything that can keep them from falling. I grab hold of a railing, and my palm immediately bursts when I grasp it. I endure it as best as I can, refusing to let go. Others aren't so lucky and are unable to keep hold. Damon slips past me and is thrown over the railing. I watch him plummet down into the boiling sea. He surfaces, already screaming, splashing and flailing around in the scalding hot water. 
His skin turns red, and his flesh starts melting away as he desperately tries to swim back to the rig. When he shouts out, no actual words come. There's just horrible, agonizing shrieks before he falls back beneath the currents and bursts into flames in the currents. The rig rocks violently again, and I see the steaming water around us start to be covered in a thick layer of darkness. The umbilical tube drawing oil must have burst and is now spilling the sludge into the sea. This is quickly becoming a disaster, probably not unlike the incident in 1988. Oil poisoning the water might be the least of the world's problems, though, if the doused gets its way. I stare down into the boiling black water and refuse to fall in, even as my hands are burning, holding onto the railing. The oil in the water ignites and the ocean around us is transformed into a massive inferno. The enormous wall of flames around the rig brings so much smoke and heat. The whole place is falling apart, probably ready to completely collapse into the death that surrounds us. Hey! Old man Mallory is approaching, keeping hold of a stray cable and using it to keep himself steady. He grabs hold of me and pulls me up from where I'm dangling over the edge of the railing. We climb up the cable. The bottom of my boots melt when they touch down on parts of the rig until we are able to stand steady on part of the platform. I look down at the skin on my hands, which has been terribly burned. When I look around, there's nothing but fire in all directions. I don't see a way out of this. We're going to die on this oil rig. The old man puts a hand on my shoulder. Mallory usually seems so lost and confused, but now he's different. He's present and focused and seems younger somehow. I survived this once before. Stay with me and we might make it through this, kid. I listen to Mallory. He's right. He's the only one on the rig that ever experienced the doused before tonight. And he made it through the first time. We need to get to the lifeboats, he says. We can't stay in the rig any longer. The whole thing is going to fall into the water. I can't even see the water anymore. The tides are completely shrouded by flames. How did you stop it the first time? I shout. During the incident. I can see the pain in the old man's eyes. The newfound strength he was showing fades. The wrinkles on his face deepen, and he seems to age a little just from thinking back on the trauma of what he went through last time. It was just like this. It was burning away everything. We all knew by that point that it wasn't an ordinary fire, that there was something sinister here. My boss at the time, he was willing to do anything to stop it, to make any deal with whatever we were dealing with. So he did. Sacrifice. That was what it took to appease it, offering our own to be burned. It's too late for that now. It's not waiting for offerings anymore. It's taking whoever it wants, and it seems to want to consume every single one of us. It doesn't sound like it wants to stop here either. The doused wants to set the whole world on fire, and I think it might be able to. I don't think that's an option anymore. I know, he says. We need to try to get out of this alive. We're the only people that can tell the rest of the world a little about what's happening, if they'll listen. He's probably used to people not taking his story seriously. We all treated him that way for years because it seems so insane until you were seeing it firsthand. He was right about the heat and flames rising the whole time. I hope he knows that I realize that now and how sorry I am for not listening to him. We carefully make our way across the tilted platform of the rig, making sure to be careful what we touch. We also narrowly avoid some explosions that are being set off from the contents of what we have on board. Barrels of oil go off like bombs across the platform. We pass by more of our co-workers spontaneously immolating or falling off of the rig. It's horrible to see, but there's nothing we can do for them. Mallory's right. We just need to get away from the rig and away from the fire. It's too late for the rig, but the rest of the world might still have a chance to be saved. We reach the lifeboats and climb in. The familiar dry, cracking voice comes out of the old man's mouth. I think I recognize this one. He looks familiar. He's felt my presence before. Mallory's eyes widen with fear as he must realize what's happening. The rest of him catches fire, and I see a familiar grin stretch across his burning face. The elderly man is suddenly moving with so much energy, but it's more like his limbs are being puppeted by something inside of him. 
The doused has control of his body, just like it took control of Kirk's. It lets out a crazed laugh. <laughs> Where are you going? I want you to see this, just like the old man did. It grabs hold of my arm and I start to catch on fire. It is enjoying this. It's saving me for last. I try to pull away from the doused's grasp, but it keeps burning me. I need to get away from it and away from this place. I use my free hand to hit the clamp, keeping the lifeboat suspended over the water. It breaks and the boat falls down into the burning sea. Mallory stumbles from the impact of the boat hitting the surface, tripping overboard into the fire and burning away in front of me. The old man doesn't deserve to die like this. No one does. The water is so hot that the oars in my hands catch fire the moment I try to row the boat with them. I cast them into the inferno, realizing that I have no way of actually getting away from this. Every part of my body is burning up in the sweltering heat all around me. I cough on the black clouds of smoke staining the air. The flaming currents crash against my boat and splash at me. I don't have long. I know that. There's nothing but fire. Even the ocean is burning away. The inferno around me seems to roar and laugh. There is fire in all directions, completely covering the ocean. I'm not sure how far it's spread or how deep the flames go. The ocean's water might all be fire now. It's hard to tell from where I am. The ocean is said to take up 71% of the whole world. A majority of the world might now be on fire. There's nowhere for me to go. The little boat I'm on is melting away around me. It won't last much longer either. We're doomed to burn. There's no doubt about that anymore. I look out at the ocean of fire. Horribly burned bodies swim at the surface of the blaze. They stare and grin at me with what little is left of their smoldering bodies. It's the crew of the oil rig. People that I have seen for every day. The doused is taunting me. It wants me to lose all hope. I refuse to listen to it. Maybe my death can mean something. Offerings were enough to appease it before, at least for a while. Maybe a sacrifice can dampen the fire again, or maybe not. I'm going to die either way. I touch one of the bleeding gashes on my arms and start to smear it on my face. I do my best to recreate the symbol that Kirk drew on the human sacrifices. Hopefully, it's enough. I watch the oil rig I've worked on crash into the hell around us, like it never existed at all. Apparently, the rig was the protector of the world from this fire. I wish I knew that when I started this gig, but better late than never. As I watch the rig disappear in the inferno, I remember why I'm out here to begin with. My job is to go down and ensure the maintenance of the oil rig. Even as the platform melts into the tides, that is still what I am here to do. If I can't do it for the rig anymore, perhaps I can do it for the rest of the world. Yes, I have a job to do. I stare into the burning, glowing ocean that stretches into every horizon. That's all that might be left. I take in a deep breath, and I dive into the sea one last time. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.